it's time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. Um, what we're going to do today, um, I had a lot of phone calls on the show that we did. It was called A Prison's Food for Thought, and we was asked to go into more details about some of the sentencing and guidelines and what happens to people actually after they do get to the penitentiary. Then also we did a show, it was called uh, Jury Duty for Your Information, and um, in which this is where we showed you that how important it is for you as a citizen to make the right decision because that's the part of the story that I'm sure that you are not being told when, when you do vote uh, guilty or innocent. And um, we had two wonderful guests at that time, um, Patricia Michaels, I said it right this time, and Tom Stahl. And they were nice enough to volunteer to come and elaborate on some of the things we've already talked about. The other thing I need to mention, um, as often, Margaret Brennan did the opening shot, and that is the first out of a series of paintings she is doing. Um, they called "Welcome to America." So, if the if this painting um, shocked you, that is the intention to, to get your at attention and to be a little shocked about some of the things that we do to our fellow man. And so, I guess having said all that, how are you? Did you have a nice trip again? Yes, you I did. did. Beautiful trip. It was a beautiful sunshine day the day I drove over. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we try to change the weather and do the best that we can for you. So Thank you. I'm glad we accommodated you. Same it's for you? Very nice and very good to be here again. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, maybe we can refresh the friend's memory what we talked about. Um, we talked about the, the, liabil the liability of and the rights of a jury and uh, what it takes for a jury to get people into the prison system. And then in the other show, we discussed Unicor, an organization that makes sure that you, um, that you work in the capacity for which you intended, which is slavery in America, and it's illegal slavery. And so, um, having said all that, do you have a preference to go to a certain subject in, in the beginning at this time? Well, I think that we need to recognize that slavery doesn't always have a capital S attached to it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come in on big, bold letters, easily identifiable. Mm -hmm. We had slavery when we had black people enslaved on plantations, mm -hmm. on cotton plantations. But we have modern forms of slavery now. Same principle. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the same principle applies However, it's not called slavery anymore. Mm -hmm. It's called our prison system. Mm -hmm. um, to summarize this for you again, the, the name of the organization eventually became Unicor. Um, in 1934, President Roosevelt signed into legislation the, the federal prison industries. And then in 1980, that got renamed um, Unicor. It is a stock in, in that. Is available exclusively to judges, lawyers, um, and um, law enforcement. Um, what they do, they became an industry uh, manufacturing over 300 different products. It's, it occupies about 50 factories that um, are provided with contracts by the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, at last count, their sales were in excess of $600 million million dollars a year and uh, so nine out of ten prisoners are nonviolent so they make sure they have a workforce at all time so maybe that's why we should go to the mandatory prison sentences maybe you like to tackle uh, that. yeah I would like to talk about that because what mandatory sentences mean is that you're going to have people in prison for longer periods of time and if you've got a prison industry set up, and I'm very disturbed that the stock is available only to judges, lawyers, and law enforcement, because there's a built-in incentive to keep sending more workers into prison to work in the company that these judges and lawyers own. I mean, it's like about the height of corruption. You can't think of anything much more corrupt than that. 
But the mandatory sentencing makes the sentences longer, the person stays in longer, and as the public may or may not be aware, parole has been abolished in the federal system. Yes, it has. Many people still think of prison as, oh, these sentences don't mean much because, oh, those prisoners are just out real short. You know, I mean, they'll be back on the street. Yeah, and then when they're doing sentencing, they sentence you to months, like 340 months. Oh, that's all, just a few months. But 340 months is 27 years. And I think that's done deliberately so we don't notice that. Yeah. So now we get back to what you were saying. The cruelty is, is yeah. not uh, as apparent. And I, I want to come back to something you said, a nine out of 10 being nonviolent. Yes, what a, an industry wants in a prison when they're making valuable products, they don't really want criminals. They don't want people who are violent and disruptive. They want nonviolent people. Mm -hmm. So if anybody is getting back out of prison pretty quickly, mm -hmm. the prison industry would have the incentive to uh, influence the prison system to get rid of the violent criminals, get them exactly. out, and give us more gentle, peaceful, skilled people, bring them in. So there you have a mandatory sentences for something like drugs, a nonviolent, arguably victimless crime, and no mandatory sentences, say, for uh, crimes that are more violent, more violent than that. Exactly. Uh, home breaking and things mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. Now you see, Dave, what it does. And then by the high return of, uh, you know, for par uh, parole violations or whatever mm -hmm. small thing there is, it's a lot easier to re-employ them than to retrain them. Mm -hmm. And at the same token, what this also does to the everyday person is um, they are able to underbid some of the local uh, establishments mm -hmm. and run businesses into bankruptcy. So it's really a double-edged sword that I believe every every person should look at, you know, and we say our taxes goes to the prisons. Well, it does, but they pay for a lot of things. Um, the, the telephone, uh, we can do a whole show just on the telephone calls. Uh, mm -hmm. we, are you familiar with that? We talked about that. I, was that you? Where the person calls you collect and, mm -hmm. and they cut you off. So that's another whole industry there. Yes. I think there's a whole sub-industry in the prisons yeah. of the very costly phone calls yeah. to the prisoners' families yeah. and also um, in the mail that the prisoners are allowed to receive and not receive is very tightly controlled. Mm -hmm. So you've got some real abuses of power going on here that goes way beyond uh, any penal, legitimate penal objectives. Yeah, and even the visitors now, now for instance, if you go uh, visit somebody at a penitentiary, I don't know if that applies to attorneys, um, the only thing I've witnessed there, and the friends know I go to the penitentiaries quite often, uh, every once in a while they will even change the rules on an attorney. One day he can take a briefcase or, uh, or she can wear high heels and the next day that's not acceptable what that means. You have to get back in your car, go back to your office or your hotel. Uh, if you don't have what they is what's called for for the day, then you have to go make a purchase. And often thought they got a kick back from that. So you, you're always on their time. So we, we are victims of that also. And I don't know how we're going to change it, but I sure like to do something about that, you know. Well, uh, on that note, it is interesting to notice in some ways the rise of the police state in America. And we have a police state now, and there is a newspaper I'll hold up here. I suppose let the people focus on it who have cameras. Um, it says, debate grows as the prison population nears 2 million. 2 million prisoners in the United States? I'll mm -hmm. hold that. Yeah. I had uh, some of the guys send some things to me from the penitentiary, and it quoted Jesse Jackson that it's like $8 billion is spent for education and $23 billion is spent for prisons. Now, something's wrong with that. Something, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to mention that uh, our prisons now in certain states are becoming whole little cities unto themselves. Uh, it's really the prison industry has grown up. It's a whole bureaucracy in and of itself, and it's a lot like the rest of our government. It's just grown exponentially. It's grown at leaps and bounds and we don't seem to be able to control it. The prisons 
are paralleling that growth in government. They're they're out of control, basically. Yeah, and not it's not only the people inside that you know uh, have consequences. It's the families. It's uh, like I said, some of the local businesses. And we really need to look at that some other kind of way because we cannot enslave people. Now, on the, on the prison show, the young lady said that, um, and unfortunately, I didn't verify that, but in the Constitution where it says that uh, slavery is abolished unless in the setting of a prison, is that really a law? That is true. That is okay. a 13th yeah. Amendment to the United States That's Constitution right. yeah. says, and I'll paraphrase, or nearly have a copy in my pocket, I don't today, mm -hmm. Uh, it says that uh, no condition of slavery or involuntary servitude shall exist in any state or in the United States except upon conviction of a crime. Yeah. And that leads me to something that Ann Rand said. Um, she said the government has no power over innocent men. It only has power over criminals. Mm -hmm. And so for government to grow, and its power to grow, it must make more and more men and women into criminals to get power over them. And that's how we see the growth of our laws. More and more laws, more and more crimes. We have about two million laws now, so that anybody just about can be gotten for anything, anything and then sent away for a long time. Any, and then also what it does, uh, when you look at the age group, and um, I go to penitentiaries often, some of my young is 16, and then some of my old is 70 something. But on an average, um, the, the average inmate that I've seen, mm -hmm. and keep in mind I go to the visiting room, I would say they are between 22 and 41 years old. They're mostly minorities, uh, most of them Afro American, uh, Cubans, some Latinos, lots of Native Americans. In, uh, very few Caucasians per se because they come in a different crime. They don't, they don't come too often into the drug um, crimin, criminal mm -hmm. element. They come into making the bombs and, and because mm -hmm. from the military that's what they learned and in order to get them off the street they have to put them in a different category. Um, you know, so we learn how to classify that. And so you take that whole middle piece of males out of society, if they get out tomorrow, they can't vote. So you have a whole, a whole generation that is speechless. That's and, right. And disenfranchised, so mm -hmm. they can't participate in the political process. They can't really come back after they've been incarcerated and do something to change the unjust laws that they were convicted under or do something to change the political stripe of the people that are in power. They're really powerless. And I, and I understand you, you're more familiar with, with um, women per, uh, uh, prisoners? Well, I'm somewhat because I have a friend that is incarcerated at the present time and she hasn't been incarcerated very long, but I'm really having my eyes opened about uh, what it's like for a friend to visit someone in prison and send mail to them. Uh, I found out just recently that uh, in our prison system in, in Washington State, you can't send stamps to prisoners. Mm -hmm. Well, I would question that. Uh, what possible harm can come by sending stamps to a prisoner? I mean, obviously a prisoner could use those mm -hmm. for their personal mail, but I, I see no problem with that. I asked that question. I can help you with that. Uh, the reason you can't send stamps uh, because you could have you could have removed the glue, then you can put drugs under it and, and put an acrylic over it and pass it in as a stamp. So that's why. That's a stretch. But that's, that's stretch. the reasons that they give you. <laughs> it, it's really, Especially that's if you'd be sending the stamps to somebody that had never had anything to do with drugs, right? Why would there be anything on those stamps? Um, I mean, by that same argument, they could keep anything from coming in the prison, even food. Why are trucks bringing food in? There could be, you know, drugs sometimes are very small. Actually, that is a very handy law to have, drug laws, because if the police are searching for, say, a stolen car, mm -hmm. 
there's only so many places they can look. They can look in the garage. <laughs> they can't look under a stamp. <laughs> exactly. In the barn. They can look, you know, in a warehouse or something or in a grove of trees. But they can't pull the walls out of your home or go through your children's underwear. Yes, or do they a, can. Oh, well, for a stolen car. Oh, for a stolen car. You might well, we have probably. a car in your underwear. See, uh, th that's my point. Yeah. Uh, traditional crimes, the laws do not become as intrusive as when you have the the victimless crime intruding into your very personal habits, what you do with your body, becomes very, the law becomes very intrusive. They do the body cavity search or go through your kid's underwear for a drug uh, investigation. But for a stolen car, no, you can't, it's absurd. They wouldn't even get that intrusive. Yeah, but then if that person goes to prison and you are the family, they can do all of that to you in order for you to go see your loved ones for 20 minutes. We were mm -hmm. really shocked uh, when we went to fill out the application blank to become a visitor into the Washington State mm -hmm. Prison s System. Uh, we had to reveal our own social security numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm not certain why that's important or why that's necessary. Uh, their constant reference in this application was that the prisoner was the offender. Mm -hmm. The prisoner wasn't an inmate. That's what I would call them. Mm -hmm. That's a less uh, egregious word. But they use the term offender, and they use it repeatedly in this application. Mm -hmm. And then they get somewhat accusatory. They, they want to know if you've had any connection with this offender, mm -hmm. if you've ever committed a crime with this offender. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole process is very demeaning. It is. Mm -hmm. Because I am a citizen. I am merely going to visit someone in the prison system, and I shouldn't be grilled like this. Uh, they may have some legitimate reason to have some sort of a cursory search, but um, I see no reason for the citizens to go through this. I have a citizen story for you. I, uh, wow. I was in one of the penitentiaries. Uh, you know, you, you come in, you fill out the papers, like you said, then you go, you go to the metal detector and whatever else. And, um, and then they take you to another place and you wait, and then eventually another um, officer will come and take you to the third place, you know, to be stamped and everything. Well, I had already been stamped. There was a lot of commotion on the other side of the, uh, this device, and I couldn't really see what was going on, but it got really, really bad, and then eventually they asked us to leave. Uh, no explanation, just everybody leave. So we did that. And it took three weeks to find out what had happened. Uh, one day they stamp you on the left side, and the next day on the right side with whatever stamp, you know, a fluorescent stamp that they give you. And that particular day, they were stamping the right hand, and a lady came in, an, an older woman in a wheelchair. And she had got that far, well, she had no arm. So she they wasn't able to stamp her right hand. And because of that, they refused her entry. So understandably, the rest of the women, the visitors, they was going to snatch this guard and you know, put <laughs> fear guard in her, very understandably. Uh, but it didn't come to that, so we were all removed. But think of that. Now, this lady was a citizen, not an offender. She just didn't have a right arm for that day. Can yeah. you imagine that? Well, this is what happens when we're in a totally powerless position yeah. and the government has all the power and it can be used very unjustly and yeah. very meaninglessly against us except to always remind us that the person in there is an offender mm -hmm. and that we are coming to see an offender and that we are the friend of an offender. Yeah. So they're really putting a black mark on all of us. It's pretty bad. Yeah, it's, it, it's pretty bad. And so um, back to the slave thing here for a minute. So this offender um, gets paid 23 cents an hour on an average. Um, and out of that, you know, they, they buy their clothes and everything and the rest of the money comes from the offender's friends and families because nothing is free. Um, we as taxpayers pay a lot of money. I don't know how they're using it because here they double jeopardy, they're paying for everything mm. again, you see. and. Um, I don't know where we could even start to change that unless just make people aware of it. But most people don't want to hear that. Well, most people like the idea, I think, that it's healthy for someone to be occupied 
meaningfully in prison and to learn a trade and to do a job and to maybe produce something and get paid. And that all sounds really good, and I think that might be a good idea. Mm -hmm. But we've carried it to such extremes, and I don't think most Americans are aware of the enormity mm -hmm. of the corporate involvement in our prisons to the point now where we yeah. really have a plantation system. Yeah. This isn't just, uh, you know, the average, uh, average prisoner earning a living and learning a trade. It is really a whole... Um, what do I want to say? An industry that's been built into it our is. prison. It's the phone companies. It's Victoria Principal. They total sweatshop. So it's not that they they working for the government or to make the money so they can so they can pay back the taxpayers. That's not even what they're doing. It's slaves. And there's a certain vicious circle to this. As a unicorn and the prison industry with all their prisoners makes products. You pointed this out. These products compete or can compete yeah. in the free world area. And so then the blue collar workers in the free world area, they're put out of business. They can't compete against the slave labor, you know, 23 cents mm -hmm. an hour. They lose their jobs. Some of those who lose their jobs to support their families or out of desperation or anger, they might turn to crime. Mm -hmm. If they turn to crime, guess what? All of a sudden, another slave yeah, is stuffed applied. into prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think another thing that's happening in our society is that we're really overpopulating the world. We've got something yeah. like six billion people. Six billion. And so there's a part of us, maybe it's subconscious almost, where we want to have whole classes of undesirables where we can just shove them off and they can't compete with us mm -hmm. for things like housing, food, jobs. So we're a little bit willing to go along with things like the drug war. That'll take whole classes of citizens and like you pointed out, a lot of young people, a lot of people of color end up in prison. We take those whole classes out of society and they're not going to compete with me for a job or for somewhere to live or something to eat. Mm -hmm. And we can demonize them, put them in prison, make them slaves, and then I can get the things I need. And the, the larger our <coughs> society comes, the, the bigger our population is. Mm -hmm. I think the more this is going to happen, it's like putting the chickens in a cage and overcrowding the cage. Pretty soon the chickens start pecking at each other and killing each other. So we've got that dynamic going on in our country where a lot of people aren't really sympathetic about the prisoners, unless, of course, it's one of their friends. Yeah, and also, I mean, mothers go to prison. Uh, I, I want to get back to that here in just a minute. Uh, the children, they become orphans because it is this, uh, now, when you are arrested, especially in the, in the uh, war against drugs, um, they, they take everything you own. Uh, they take your car, your house, uh, everything. So even if you did come out, what do you do? You have no means, and so you have the offender, but the family lost their house, don't know where to live. And it's almost a genocide in a in a really in a really uh, strange way. So, how do you think we're going to fix that? I see the rise of the police state and prisons, uh, and the large percent of our of our population in prison corresponds with the decline of the jury. If we, may I mention the jury? Yeah, go, go right back to the jury, please. The, we have a jury that is a form of a jury. It looks like a jury because there's 12 people there, but it's not the jury in the sense that the founders of the United States knew a jury. Mm -hmm. To recount last time, the founding fathers of this country, the only jury they knew about was the powerful independent jury that judged the law, judged the facts, and judged whether the laws were just and had complete independence in rendering their verdict. Mm -hmm. They were not bound by the judge's instructions. Well, when you have those kind of juries and the jury hears the facts and maybe uh, and, and in the last century, the rules of evidence were not like they are now. Much more evidence came in. The juries would stop this. See, to get people into prison, you have to go through the door of the jury. The jury has to find them guilty. Mm -hmm. A real jury, an independent jury, would stop a lot of this and say, these victimless crimes, we're not going to convict these people. As uh, Pat pointed out last time, the Fugitive Slave Act, the jury would not convict Quakers for yeah. uh, helping slaves escape through the Underground Railroad. Those Quakers did not go to prison. The jury, if they revolt against that kind of thing today, might end the drug war. 
and then the largest cause of people being incarcerated, that would end. Mm -hmm. And the prisons would begin to clear out. If the juries end the drug war, then there'll be big pressure on the politicians to pardon those people who are already in. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, one man is running for president of the United States, second time. Uh, he was on the ballot in every state four years ago. He will be again. Harry Brown, the libertarian, he has promised to pardon approximately one million people, use presidential pardon powers, at least in the federal system, mm -hmm. to take people who haven't harmed anyone, nonviolent people, and take them out of prison. That would not make him a very popular president. I'm it sorry. May not. It may not. <laughs> uh, another thing I think that is feeding this vicious cycle of putting yeah. people into prison is the plea bargaining system. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's really gotten to be a little industry in and of itself. Defense attorneys like it, just like the prosecutors mm -hmm. like it. The prosecutors don't have to go to trial, and neither do the defense attorneys. So even when you have an innocent person, if they feel threatened enough that their, their conviction mm -hmm. is so certain and that their penalties are going to be so severe, a lot of times they will just confess or agree to plea to a lesser offense so that they'll get off a little easier. But they will end up in the prison system. Yeah, but now the, the case uh, that, that Omar, in my book, the thing here is, first of all, he, didn't, he was innocent. And then when the plea bargaining came, they wanted him to plead guilty. And so that would give him 20 years and, a, and a two million million dollar fine. So they took everything, but you can get two million dollars, you see. So that's the whole thing. Then he retaliated against that. He did take his chance with a jury. And when the jury couldn't, couldn't make that decision, they went to the judge and they repeatedly refused to give new instructions. So a lot of people fall to that crack. That's really what happens. You know, and as, and as regular people, we need to look at the whole picture, you know, like we do sometimes. I think the whole stretch of history shows that the jury, when they receive all the information they need to receive, they will come to a just verdict. So a lot of times when we have trials that we think went the wrong way, mm -hmm. you really need to know what went on behind the scenes, how that jury was selected, what kind of jury instructions they got, whether they were told repeatedly they had to apply this law even though they felt it wasn't a just law, mm -hmm. what uh, evidence was allowed in. The evidence basically is controlled by the judge. By the judge. And it has been said by famous people, and I can't remember who they are, but it's a good point well taken that the really the most critical evidence is usually the evidence that was hotly debated by the lawyers and that it was kept from the jury. Yeah. That is usually the evidence that they really need the most. They need the most, yeah. So we, we shouldn't blame the juries because in the whole stretch of history when we've had what Tom referred to as independent juries, juries that are powerful, juries that hear all the information, they will, by and large, do the right thing. We even had white slave owners serving on Fugitive Slave Act cases mm -hmm. that acquitted really? fugitive slaves and people that harbored them. And these were slave owners mm -hmm. who may have had slaves of their own, but there was a part of them, another part of them, that maybe that more sub.